Okay, we're just going to go over the uh, Mitsunobu reaction. Now here's a scheme for it. Basically, we take a, an alcohol. It doesn't have to be chiral, but in this case, it illustrates a point. So we take an alcohol, and we react it with um, triphenophosphine, a species called dead, and in this case, we've got carboxylic acid. But it can be any nucleophile, and the pKa of this proton here on the nucleophile. So we've got. Let me just draw that up there. So we've got nucleophile okay so that's the conjugate acid of the nucleophile uh, the pKa of that you'll see it quoted as being uh, it's got to be less than 15 okay that's the general rule of sum for that okay and, and this will work as a, a nucleophile providing it's not too hindered of course so it's, the old aim of the Minnesota-Norby reaction is to create a really good leaving group here so it creates a good leaving group and it also inverts this center and that might be useful in uh, in um, chiral synthesis applications so this is the um, species you would probably not come across unless you've done this normal type of work uh, this is diethylase or dicarboxylate also known as dead uh, there are variants of this like the isopropyl and um, and other um, diazo di is or dicarboxylate um, species which have just been modified basically to make the reaction proceed better um, okay so we'll we'll just slide down and get on with the mechanism I'll just take a copy of this actually see me drawing it again so we take the um, dead group copy that okay just slide this up so the first, first thing to do is attack um, the dead group. So you have to excuse my creaking chair. So we take uh, triphenylphosphine. And the first step is you attack from the lone pairs and phosphorus onto uh, diazo species to create this zwitterionic structure here. And what I'll do, I will cheat again. Just paste that in because the structure is going to be very, very similar. And I'll just put it there to give me a bit more room. And I'll just delete one of those little bonds there. Okay, so it comes in here, attacks, leaves a negative charge on uh, this nitrogen. So now I've got phosphorus attacks uh, attached to there. And that's positive charge. So we've got a, a, a polar species here. Um, and it's, it's free, it's stabilized with the um, ester, and this is now susceptible um, to attack, and so on. So the next stage is um, deprotonation of the nucleophile. So if we've got a carboxylic acid in this case, I'll try and remember which ones used which R group so R4 so the first the next stage is protonation of that to give just giving myself a bit more room to give um, this species here I'll draw it out can't, can't be lazy all the time. Okay, still got its charge on there like that. Like I said, these these um, ethoxy groups can be replaced. Okay, so the next stage is um, the the coupling of this reagent with. Um, this species here. So what happens is we have our, I'll replace our chiral alcohol here. You remember this chiral alcohol, I'll just replace that with a, an ROH just to save space on the on the page really. But I'll draw it in blue to differentiate it. Okay so we've got R OH here and that then 
comes in with its long pairs tax phosphorus that goes off there like that so that's going to give us um, this species which is a bit of a pain sometimes when you're doing the reaction I'll leave the charge on because it'll, it'll pick the charge up off that in a minute. Okay, and that's going to keep the charge on phosphorus there. Um, so I'll, I'll draw that off here actually. So I'll draw the products over here. So we've got R, O, P, PH3, plus, and we've got. Um, the proton from the alcohol still on there and this is positively charged here as well so obviously that's not um, going to happen in, in terms of it's not going to um, stay on there like that because um, if uh, triphene or phosphine Oxide, uh, triphenol phosphine moiety here has got positive charge. This isn't going to have a positive charge. So there is a little bit of debate over this mechanism, but as you can see, this will quite easily pick up a proton anyway. And this is in neutral conditions. So it's probably bad practice to draw the two charges like that because that's clearly not going to happen. So I'll just delete that out for now. Okay, so probably best to use um, the anion of this to pick up the proton of this because uh, that will be in equilibrium and that will attack here to give you a neutral species in the end. Okay, so if I delete this off here and we'll put a negative charge on, on there, that's the best way to represent that I think. In that reaction mechanism to give this neutral species. So we started off um, this um, attacks here, puts the negative charge onto here, and we end up with this species here. Okay, so we started off with negative and positive, we ended up with negative and positive. So it kind of balances itself out that way. Okay, so the next stage in, um, in the reaction doesn't actually attack phosphorus anymore, and this is this is going in and out of equilibrium, as you can imagine. As soon as this starts crashing out, so we just pick up a proton. That's kind of kind of that out of the equation, really. So that can pick up a proton from anywhere. So in this case, we've got carboxylic acids around. So let's pick up that proton there. It's nice and stable, and then that'll kind of crash out the solution. So once we've got this here, this is our our activated species now. So I'm going to draw it back in the chiral form that we had before. So we'll just quickly run up to the top, as you can see there. So I'm going to take this here. I'm going to take that structure here, which is chiral. Well, it was chiral. It doesn't have to be chiral for the Mitsun Albury reaction. But I'll make it chiral here in this case. As you can see, that it'll invert them. I'll just move that there like that. I'm just going to sharpen up a little bit, get rid of that, and put the phosphine, uh, triphene or phosphine moiety onto it. P, PH3. So that, I'll draw them. That is the same as that, okay? With a positive charge there like that. Now, what happens now is the carboxylate which I said was R4 comes in and it goes SN2 tack on this but it inverts that center completely inverts that center there we can have a look at that in a bit more detail later on but we got R4 here Oh. and 
now if we invert that center there so that's our oxygen this is our oxygen here so we'd have we could still have that group going back there r3 would be in the plane that would stick out like that r1 r2 so if we twisted this around if you will then you'd see if you turn it around like in that direction to move it down there like that then you'd probably um, see um, that this R3 has swapped with the R2 so it has inverted I can do that with this tool here so hopefully you'll be able to see that it's inverted try and move it around see that works okay the R groups have moved as well um, but if you quickly look um, this R1 is still coming out of the plane R2 is now over on this side and R3 is on this side here all I've done is swap that around so if you look it's like a mirror image of the chiral center just because I've inverted that center there it's a bit hard to see you really need to uh, get a feel for the 3D of these kind of inversions and chiral species so that has inverted that center so hopefully you, you saw that then so let's have a look closely so that's the Miss Nordberg reaction over with that's it it's done I mean we we can cleave that off and basically you can use the Miss Nordberg reaction in that case just to invert a, a, a hydroxy group and so it's superb for um, synthesis especially you can isolate say you've got the wrong uh, enantiomer or diastereomer at one position you can invert it there and certainly you do see that sometimes in literature So I'll just have a look at the inversion of that center because I said I would. Um, we look at the carbon. You think about the carbon oxygen bond there. So this is going to be a, an sp3 orbital. I'll try and draw that in a different color. Try and make this. So an sp3 orbital, got kind of that shape with a little lobe coming out of the back there. And it's also got um, some antibonding orbitals. Which you can't see, but you're probably around here like this. Okay, so that's of this sigma bond here. All right, so that's sigma, and this is sigma star. Now, what happens when you invert center? Now, I'm going to put this group coming out here. So, this is the other things that are stuck onto it. So, if you attack as the center this is planar now in the transition state I've drawn it as a transition state there it's not planar there it's tetrahedral so this this is um, as it inverts in the center so let me just try and draw it without the inversion just get rid of that give it a bit of three um, three dimensional structure so this is how it originally looked before it got attacked okay so it's got tetrahedral structure there's the this this orbital here is actually the line that we normally draw that line it's called a sigma orbital and that's a sp3 orbital okay now if if i draw that in that structure there let's see what that's going to be that's going to be r1 that's going to be r2 i've just moved it around a little bit that's going to be r3 okay now what happens sorry that's r2 what happens is you get your nucleophile coming here, um, which is this group, which I'm going to call it nu minus. I tend to do that a lot. So nu minus. Now the first thing it does is actually fill that empty orbital. Because if you do an uh, energy level diagram for the Mitsunobu, um, just for the carbon oxygen bond, so you've got carbon oxygen and then I'll draw it in black actually then you've got the energy level diagrams here it's just a bog standard energy level diagrams and um, this is your antibody that's your sigma star that's your sigma okay the sigma bond sigma of the sp3 sp3 orbitals already full 
because it's got the carbon oxygen that's the bond if you start filling it with electrons here then this whole um, setup becomes very unstable and it has to decide basically whether um, being connected to um, as the nucleophile is more stable than being connected to the oxygen and that's basically how, how it works it, it finds its own um, uh, lowest energy configuration really or so it will slip into that quite easily unless there's energy poured into it of course so basically this is why we get inversion you get a nucleophile attacking here fills these orbitals that then flips the whole thing over this becomes more p orbital like rather than sp3 so it loses some of its s character this then flips over like an umbrella inverting so this group here let's see if i can do this this group here no that's not going to work is it this group here flips flips over just going to move it flips over here like that and just get rid of that one and inverts it's getting very messy now and inverts here and then this oxygen leaves okay and this one this nucleophile moves closer so it's basically a, like a rocking motion so it goes from we draw the original R R2 here, this is what it look, used to look like. And then it goes all the way over there like that. And I'll draw that funny arrow so you don't know it's a, so you know it's not a reaction mechanism arrow. Okay, so that goes all the way over there like that as as it inverts. So that's where we get inversion of the carol centre there. But what I'll do, I'll go over this in more detail in another tutorial. Um, and I'll, I'll post it on the site there at the side so you'll be able to get a link to the inversion of a chiral centre uh, by a nucleophilic substitution reaction. So that is basically the Mitsunobu reaction.